Well, good morning, Faith Community Church. That song is so beautiful. And that thought and that prayer that Shane just said, help us to trust in you, is at the very core of Psalm 73. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 73. This is a psalm of Asaph. We're going to be continuing our study in the summer in the Psalms. And that thought of God help us to trust in you is really at the core of what Asaph is saying here. Asaph, just a little bit of background on him. Uh, there, so we're beginning book three of uh, the book of Psalms, which begins from Psalm 73 and spans all the way to Psalm 89. Asaph wrote Psalms 73 all the way to Psalm 83, and he also wrote Psalm 50. So he's written 12 Psalms. He was appointed by David as a chief musician. So he led worship in the temple. And as you read anyone's writings, you read David's writings, you read Asaph's writings, you kind of begin to see a little bit of their character and about who they are. And so as you read Asaph's psalms, you see Asaph, he has a tender heart. He obviously loves the Lord deeply. He's a devoted worshiper. He's honest. He's transparent. He's compassionate, and yet he really struggled with doubt. And so as we, as we sang that song, Lord, we will trust in you. It's so easy to sing, and yet in moments of life when things get difficult or we see injustices in the world, to say we will trust in you, whew, that's hard. And that is what Asaph is wrestling with here. His dilemma is this, this worship leader, this man who loved his people, doubted God's goodness and his faithfulness because he was looking at all the wicked and how they're just prospering. Why do all the good things seem to happen to the bad people? Which is the opposite of the question sometimes we ask is why do bad things happen to good people, like, i got to share this with you because it literally happened maybe like 10, 15 minutes ago. As uh, I was getting ready to walk over here to church, I get a phone call from my wife who's like frantically saying, uh, my son, our son, our son, actually no, your son <laughs> just locked the door to our room, which has all of our shoes. And so we could all come to church barefoot, but is there any way that you can come help us? And so... You know, like a good father, I'm like 950, do, 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 I can make it. So I zoomed back home, picked the lock, ran back, and then I see the sound guys like sweating, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, we'll just have Aaron click slides and we'll make it happen. So, why do bad things happen to good people, right? So, this is the opposite of that question. This is why do good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked prosper? And that is what Asaph is really dealing with here. So before we jump into this passage, let's take a moment. We're going to pray, and then we'll go verse by verse and break this down. God, I praise you for this morning, and I praise you that, Lord, in every situation, you are there, and you are still good, and you're sitting on the throne, and you're here with us now. So God, as we just go through Psalm 73 and look at Asaph and just his, his struggle, Lord, thank you that this is written for us to learn, and thank you that, um, Lord, we can just glean from these lessons. We pray that your spirit would just speak to us anew again. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Psalm 73, we're going to read through it in its entirety, and then we're going to go verse by verse and just break it down. So it's titled, The Tragedy of the Wicked and the Blessedness of the Trust in God, a Psalm of Asaph. Begins by saying this, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. 
They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. They say, how does God know, and is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease, the increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence, For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with tears. As a dream when one awakens, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold, me by your, you hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. This is Asaph's psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. And the first 14 verses, uh, I've titled this kind of the dilemma. And and what is Asaph's dilemma? The, The dilemma is this. Asaph asks, why do the wicked prosper? Why, God? So beginning in verse 1, Asaph says this, Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. And I love how he starts this. It's a beautiful example for us to remember. It's this foundation that God is good all the time. And all the time? Amen. You guys are like a good Baptist church. This is... God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Psalm 107, verses 1 to 2, I love. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is what? Good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, or let them tell their story, or let them testify. You know, it's just a wonderful way to begin, because Asaph is about to go into some really heavy stuff. But before he gets into that, He's like, this is my foundation. Truly, God is good. He's good to his people. And it's just this reminder that no matter how we feel in a situation, no matter our emotions, God remains good. Now, this doesn't discredit the things that we're going through or the emotions that we feel, but rather challenges us to base our perception of reality and everything that's going on in this truth that God is good just as Asaph did. So he starts out saying, truly God is good, and then he gets into it. But, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My feet had nearly slipped. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there, like a a dark soul, a dark season, or just a a really moment of doubt. Um, But this is where Asaph was. Remember, Asaph wasn't just any person. Like, he's the person up here leading worship for God's people. The person who who God had appointed to be there, and he is struggling. And going on to verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. God is good, but I almost slipped, I almost stumbled. Why? Because he saw. Now, 
the word saw there, this is this idea not just to glance over and see, but really to stop and just gaze and see and wonder why. And I love that he adds this, for I was envious. We see Asaph began to doubt God's goodness and his fairness because he, his mind was so focused and occupied by the wrong things. Now, friends, I want to ask you, has your mind, your thoughts ever been focused and occupied on the wrong things? You see the prosperity of the world, and, and it's one thing to glance and be like, yeah. But then it's like, you just see, and then your heart just gets envious. Worship leader, pastoral heart, the man who should never struggle with envy, and, and yet he's very clear here. Verse 4, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. He says, God, it seems to me that they go through life and they have health and prosperity. Nothing goes wrong for them. And, and yet here are my friends who love you, Lord. Here's me who loves you, Lord. And God, I, I wake up and I got a little ache here all the, every day. And, and, you know, every time I sit down, I just go, Ugh, you know, I just make those grunting noises. I'm practicing for, you know, when I get a little older. <laughs> In our last elder meeting, I sat down, I made a grunt. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm practicing, so. Verse 5 to 7, they are not in trouble as other men. They are not plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. What an illustration. Wow. This vivid picture. They have more than heart could wish. Asaph sees they have no troubles. They have no hardships. They're violent even probably to get what they want. No matter what's in their way, they'll get it. They, they have so much, Lord. The wicked have so much. Their eyes are just bulging with abundance. They don't know what to do with all this. Verse 8 to 9. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth against the heaven, and their tongue walks through the earth. The wicked do whatever it takes. Whoever stands in their way, manipulate, and they brag about it. They laugh in the face of God, and instead of punishment, Asaph sees that they prosper. God, what's going on? Where is your goodness, God? Where is your justice? Aren't you a fair and just God? We see here verse 10. The people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. I want to read you verses 9 to 10 from a version that I normally wouldn't read out of, but it's actually a really good illustration because we're seeing Asaph's heart here, and it's very honest. It's the message, and it says this. It translates it like this. Talking about the wicked, they are full of hot air. I know you know one or two, or maybe people, maybe not personally, or maybe personally, that are just full of hot air. Loud mouths, disturbing the peace. And then Asaph says, People actually listen to them. Can you believe it? Like thirsty puppies, they lap up their words. And when I read this verse, I, I just thought of this passage in 1 Corinthians, that the wisdom of the world is what? Foolishness with God. I think of so many things that we see in our world, so many things that are promoted, these worldviews, that are thought to be wise and good to the world, but to God they are what? Foolishness. The world sees Christians as foolish. The world sees our wisdom, which comes from the Lord, as foolish, but really the world's, fool the world's wisdom is foolishness to God. Verse 11 and 12. And they say, How does God know? And is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease, they increase in riches. I read verse 12, and I can almost just see like a dejected, just <sighs> Asaph, like, these are the wicked God. They say, I am God. They laugh at you. They do bad things. And, um, and this, is, this is the worship leader. This is the pastoral heart 
This is him. Verse 13 goes on. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Now, I read verse 14 and I, I sympathize with him because sometimes we want to throw a little pity parties for ourselves. And, and I think that's what Asaph is doing here. He's like, God, every single day I just get up and it's like chasing, chasing, ch- like nothing. You ever felt like you just wake up on the right side of the bed, but everything in life is just boom, 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 boom. You get up, you get ready to preach, your son locks the door, you got to run to your house. And, un, you know. and so that is what Asaph is saying here. It's like, I'm just chastened every day. And uh, I'll read you verse 13 from the message. And it's just, it's very honest. It says this, I've been stupid to play by the rules. What's it gotten me? I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Whether it's in your relationships, maybe in school, in your work, in life in general. How about politics? I, you know, as I, as I read this, I, I couldn't help but think of the civil rights movement. And I, thought, I thought of Martin Luther King, and I thought of everything that he did, and I couldn't help but think and imagine him in a jail cell and just thinking, trying to play by the rules, what is this getting me? And my friends, this is Asaph's dilemma. Why do the wicked prosper? What is doing all this good gotten me? God, where is your goodness? Where is your faithfulness? After so many years, I, I'm beginning to down. I almost slipped and stumbled. I see all this wrongdoing going on. Why, why, why? And then we get into another section, verses 15 to 16, that I like to call a silent struggle. And this is Asaph's struggle here, verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. And and my friends, there is so much wisdom in this verse. Some of you really need to hear this today. There are times when, whether it's for the good of your family, or for the good of the church, or for the good of your weaker, in a spiritual sense, brother and sister in Christ, You and I just need to be still and silent in the presence of the Lord while we process things and then speak. There are times when our emotions will deceive and lie to us about the truths and realities that we know that God has proclaimed. Asaph, the worship leader, understood this. He hadn't yet processed all that was going on. And so to get up on a Sabbath and come before the people and just say, I just don't know, y'all. I don't know. When life is hard, Asaph should demonstrate to us that we need to be still and to be quiet before the Lord. Contrary to what social media so often tells us, that we should be loud and obnoxious, whether it is online or in person, We should just be still and quiet. You see, remember verse 1? How does Asaph start this? He says, God is what? God is what? God is good. God is good. He's been good to the generation in the past. Y'all have Bibles, hopefully in your hands. Y'all have Bibles. You, You can read how God has been good through all those generations. Think of your own life. And where God has brought you from and where you're at now. Think of this. Think of the cross and how God paid. We, we see God's love and his justice meet there. And so Asaph, this worship leader, recognizes, he says, my job is to lift people up, to draw them near to God. And so I won't grumble and I won't complain because I need to get to a point where I can tell your people, Lord, that God, life is hard. This is a struggle, but... God is good. Amen? That's when you testify. That's when you proclaim God's truths. And that's when you live out that Psalm 107, verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
He goes on in verse 17. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. And again, I love Asaph's heart. Like, this is, this is real. Like, Asaph is you. Asaph is me. He says, God, as I, as I thought of this, it's just too hard for me to understand. Spoiler alert. Until verse 17. Until I went to the sanctuary of God And this is the third section I I, I titled The Encounter with God. So we have Asaph's dilemma. Then we have the silent struggle he's going through. And then you take those two things, bring them together, and you encounter God. And that is where there is the power. And that is where there is a change. Because my friends, we are all dealt different hands. And in life, there are difficulties. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. As I, as I read this verse, I couldn't help but think, I used to think of what Pastor Mike would tell us all the time, he said, or us or anyone, he says, you know, just keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. We see Asaph here, he, he watched and he saw the, the prosperity of the wicked is so focused on this, when his eyes should have been focused on this. Asaph enters into the presence of God and then he understands. He understands the end of the wicked. He says, yeah, I see the wicked prospering, but I drew near to God and I remembered. And my friends, this is just a beautiful lesson for us. It reminds me of James chapter 4, verse 8, which is an awesome promise. If some of you are like, I feel so distant from God, I don't know what's wrong in my relationship with the Lord. Well, it's very prescriptive for us. Draw near to God and guess what? What's going to happen? He's going to draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So Asaph enters into the sanctuary. And you know what the beautiful thing is now? Y'all don't have to come to this building to draw near to God. This is an awesome place. I praise God for the buildings, for the lights, for the sound, for everything. But guess what? We could meet in that field. We could meet at Artie and Fred Peckler's house. We could meet wherever. And, uh, and God's presence would be there. You see, we are the temple of God now. His spirit indwells in us. And so, as Asaph came to the place, you know what we need to do? We just need to get down on our knees, and God, here I am. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so, as Asaph struggles with this question of God, why are the wicked prospering? He draws near to God, and he understands. He goes on, verse 18 to 20, says this, Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with tears. As a dream when one awakens, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. You ever had a bad dream? Yeah, me too, the worst. But then you wake up, and guess what? It's over, just like that. The same is is, is true with the wicked here. We are here on earth for, you know, as many years as the Lord gives us, but really in the grand scope of eternity, I can't even put it on a chart. It's so insignificant when you compare it to eternity. And it's our reality now, but one day it will be but a distant memory that we'll look back to. And do you remember, and do you remember, and how God was faithful here, and do you remember when we were so upset because we saw this, we saw this injustice, and now the wicked were prospering? But it was just a distant dream, a distant memory. Asaph realizes the fate of the wicked. It's destined for destruction and ruin. And um, we won't always get to see God's justice done here on earth. But certainly, make no mistake, God is just and holy. And justice will come either this side of heaven or on the next. But I must confess, when it happens here on earth, I can't help but say, thank you, Lord. It's about time. Praise you, Jesus. If I'm being honest. And there's an example of that in Acts. You don't have to turn with me there. You can look on the screen. Acts chapter 12, verse 22. We see Herod the Great. And uh, Herod the Great was not so great. He was just not a good man. But he came up on stage and the people were just like, it's the voice of a God and not a man. The voice of a God. And, he, and Herod's just like, yeah, that's right. I'll eat it up. And more, mas, mas, mas. And then uh, immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him. <laughs> Done. That's it. No more. Up to here, Herod. And, and 
you can only shake your fist at God and rebel against the Most High for so long until God says enough. And when God says enough, it's enough. And then you get eaten by worms and died. And here's the cool part. That was good, but this is better. But the word of God grew and what? Multiplied. Multiplied. If God is for us, who could be against us? So Asaph, verse 20, we we see just the difference between the temporal, listen here, church, we see the difference between the temporal perspective and the eternal perspective. How God's justice has actually already prevailed through the cross. And ultimately, we see the wicked prosper here on earth, but guess what? It will continue to prevail after we all meet face to face with our Lord. Verse 21 to 22 here says, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. Just such honesty. He's like, God, I really struggled with this. My mind, was, I was just distraught. I was foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Again, Asaph, he's an honest man. I hope that we can be like this before our Lord. Instead of putting up facades at times that we're doing all right. What, we see this worship leader who loves the Lord, pastoral heart. He says, I'm struggling with this. I envy them. They prosper, God. And here I am. What's, what's being righteous and good done for me? And, but you know what he does with this? He goes before God. He's like, God, I've been foolish. And I've been ignorant. He acknowledges his bitterness towards God. And then he does something. He makes a choice. And he chooses to walk humbly before God. My friends, I want to tell you this here today. We all have a choice. The things that you're given, you can choose, like the song, I love trading my sorrows. You take all the pain and you trade it for the joy of the Lord. Easy to say, hard to do. But when you do, my goodness, it is just a beautiful offering to the Lord. It's a beautiful testimony um, to others And we recognize that God is good even in these difficult and at times tragic situations. Verses 23 to 24 says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. I love that image because most of y'all are pretty grown. And I don't think that you 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 hold hands with... um, I mean, maybe your spouse or something, but I hold, I hold my hands with my son still. The other day, he's seven. He's, one day, it won't happen. But he's like, Daddy, can I hold your hand still? And I'm like, yes, son. Let me just, you know, hold that hand for as long as you want. And because uh, one day, he'll be like 13. I'll be like, son, you want to hold my hand? He's like, Dad. <laughs> so I'll embarrass him in school somehow, but, you know. But I love this image here. It's nevertheless, I'm continuing. You hold my right hand. And I just think of our Lord, and he holds our right hand. He's like, I'm here. I got you. 24. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. And I love this reminder because so much of Asaph's worry and concerns are horizontal and it's good for us to remember the vertical that one day God will call us to be in glory with him, will be absent from the body and present with our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this will all be a distant memory as we roam the kingdom of God forever. And this verse 25, church, if if you heard nothing, I hope that you'll hear this. This is my prayer for you this morning. As, As humans, we're so prone to create idols in our lives you know, I, I, the story in Exodus after Moses goes up and then he comes down and then Aaron and all the people had made a golden calf, that genuinely upsets me. Like on a, on, a, on a core level, I'm like, how could you guys just be so foolish and God's literally there and you're worshiping golden calves here. What's wrong? Well, you know what? That's me. That's me. And so as I read this verse, I couldn't help but think, church, I, my prayer for you is this, that there would be none on earth, nothing on earth that you desire that even comes close to your desire to be close to our Lord. Not your spouse, not your children, your grandchildren, your job, your bank account, your whatever. My prayer, and that's my prayer for me, that there would be nothing on earth besides our God that we would desire. And that's Asaph's uh, desire here. He, he goes, who do I have in heaven but you? And there is none on earth that I desire 
but you. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is my strength, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Again, just his honesty, he recognizes my, my emotions, they mislead, they distort the reality that God, you are good, and that God, all these things will come to, uh, to fruition one day. God, you will judge in righteousness and truth. And then verse 27 to 28, for indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. This is Psalm 73. And just a few closing thoughts, a few closing lessons that we see from Asaph's here. Number one is just honesty. Honesty. Asaph begins acknowledging his doubts and struggles, and and we can do a lot to learn from this. I think as parents as well as as grandparents to acknowledge, sometimes we, we don't have the answers We don't have it all together. And that's what Asaph does here. He recognizes his own struggles. And that even, we see here that even a faithful believer like Asaph experiences moments of doubt. Number two is seeking God's presence. In the middle of all that, the turning point for Asaph we see in verse 17. Where he, we see the importance of really seeking out God's presence, especially during times of confusion and doubt, and how drawing near to God really provides that clarity and perspective that sometimes we just can't find on our own. And number three is, is the eternal perspective. I love this, of course, it's eternity. Who doesn't want to be with the Lord? Um, but just to develop that trust in God's ultimate justice and his goodness, that even though circumstances might not seem favorable or good in the present, that one day soon God will make them all right. Number four is God's faithfulness. Even that through God, all the struggles, Asaph, he begins and he remembers. He says, God is good to remember. Remember the Lord's faithfulness to you, to your family, to the generations of believers that have come before us. Number five is personal repentance and humility. Asaph, I, I love that just his honesty. He acknowledges his bitterness, his envy, and he chooses to repent and humble himself before our God. And it's, it's, I think that this act of humility is so crucial to maintaining our relationship with the Lord because it creates this dependency. We need the Lord. And lastly is God's sufficiency. God is enough. Our Lord is enough. It's this declaration that, God, that Asaph is really truly satisfied in God alone and uh, how we can trust him for our sufficiency in everything. So as we look to communion, I, I, I couldn't help but remember just that how God's, the ultimate expression of God's goodness and justice really is demonstrated for us on the cross. And while we may struggle with the apparent prosperity of the wicked, church, I want you not to forget this, that God has already dealt with the greatest injustice of all, and that is your sin and my sin. So I think, at the, to conclude, I, Asaph's journey reminds us that in times of doubt, we look to the cross where we see God's love and his justice meet. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? God, I just thank you for Asaph and for his life and for his love for you, his honesty and just his recognition that, God, you are good at all times and at all times you remain good. Lord, I pray that, Lord, this psalm would just impact our lives, not just this week, but moving forward in our walk with you, Lord. And as we go to a time of communion, Father, I pray that you would help us to remember this. In Jesus' name, amen.